I think at a, at a core level, I mean, a lot of these algorithms, you know, you're just finding a somewhat complex, you know, potentially complex, hopefully accurate mapping. You're trying to model a process, right? So you're finding a mapping between an input and an output. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today on the program, we have Jake Mason. Jake is a senior data scientist at Carrot Health, where he's doing some fascinating work in the areas of predictive modeling. Prior to his current role, he was at United Health Group, where he developed and led teams building real-time machine learning applications. Outside of his professional work, Jake has been a co-founder of two awesome meetup groups here in the Twin Cities. The first is Analyze This, a group that focused on creating data science challenges by teams from data scientists in the community to help nonprofits and other organizations achieve what they would have not been able to do themselves. Likewise, his next group, Star82, was on a mission to help individuals learn analytics while creating positive change for nonprofits, businesses, and the public sector. Jake is also a graduate of the University of St. Thomas, a fellow Tommy like myself, where he majored in economics and had a minor or has a minor in applied statistics. Thank you for joining me today, Jake. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Justin. Awesome. Cool, man. Well, so I gave a, a little brief introduction of you, yourself. I guess I'm a little curious to find out, I guess, what's the trajectory of your career been? Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting way of, of getting into analytics, data science, AI, whatever you want to call it. You know, it, it, so you mentioned the degree I got, economics and statistics, put them together at econometrics, basically. And, mm -hmm. and really where I came from with that was I, I had an internship I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and mm. had an internship with a, uh, a local predictive analytics consulting company there after freshman year. I was a finance major going into school. I was like, oh, I'm sold. I'm going to do the banking deal and blah, blah, blah. And then I built my first, you know, econometric model. And I was like, okay, well, I, when I go back next September, I am changing my major as quickly as I can uh -huh. and, you know, trying to stay on the graduation path. But yeah, that experience was really foundational. It was, it was amazing to, I think that the model we built was predicting quarterly like net exports, just the change in US net exports or something like that. But it really grabbed me as to how that's, that's amazing. You know, we just did a little bit of math and, uh, you know, it was just a, li a linear regression model, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the potential of that really dawned on me. So, you know, went back to school, got the degree, of course, interned at Optum United Healthcare through their technology development program. You know, one of many such programs here in the Twin Cities for some of these bigger corporations developing new graduates. I had some great experiences there, uh, you know, one of those being in the IT operations machine learning group. So we did more projects than I can count mm -hmm. related to, you know, IT infrastructure, just basically helping support the uptime of our several hundred services. So a lot of, you know, unique uh, and challenging projects with that mm -hmm. stuff related to predicting the likelihood that a change to a production service causes an outage and, uh, you know, passing that on to the appropriate reviewers, making sure they're knowing, you know, which which teams are kind of trending downwards in terms of their success rates, et cetera, which changes are, are generally more likely to, to cause outages. So is this more on the lines of like DevOps ML? Yeah, so there there are a variety of use cases we, we took upon anything related to like blue screens of death, <laughs> with Windows machines. Often happens. Yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> we ran the gamut. That was, a, that was a long year, a lot of late hours. But then I worked at the health plan quality organization and United Healthcare for a while. And now I'm doing a very similar set of work at Carrot, where we provide a software as a service platform for managing the, the growth of your health plans, the quality uh, as it relates to the some of the different star measures associated with your plans, and then the health of your membership. So kind of a three module suite there. Cool. When you say star star measures, can you define that? I guess I, I don't know a whole lot about this. Of course. Area. Yeah. So star measures are it's a kind of a suite of measures uh, related to health plan quality. So like an example, there are tens of them that go by various acronyms, and it's the world of acronyms basically. There are tens of them, right? And some of them, uh, like I can name a few here. So one is the the proportion of your members who have diabetes who uh, who control their A1C, you know, have it under a, under a certain threshold there. So the the higher that rate, you know, A, your members are 
you know, more likely to be healthy. B, the, the plan will be reimbursed more by CMS, just the government, mm-hmm. because that's, you know, it's a behavior they want to incentivize, the, man, the proper management of those tests. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's medication adherence. So, you know, you have a, a hypertension, you know, how often are you taking your hypertension medications? Are you adhering to that regimen? And if not, you know, a lot of what we do is we build predictive models at an individual level to say, well, this person has been chronically non-adherent or they have they're always taking their meds and we want to appropriately identify those individuals and, and make sure we're, you know, getting in contact with them at the right time. Neat. Okay, cool. If, you know, I've, I've had a number of these podcasts here that have been really in the area of healthcare <laughs> and maybe it's just the fact that we're in Minnesota and there's so many healthcare companies, you know, around, but it feels like there's just a, there's just a ton of companies that are applying machine learning, I guess, in this, in this healthcare space. And I guess based on your background, obviously you've worked for sort of two healthcare companies, right? Yeah, it just it's it's kind of serendipity that I ended up in healthcare. I was actually talking with someone yesterday about uh, this career trajectory, and I mentioned that it was the you know United Health Group was the company I interviewed with my internship, and they offered me a job, and you know here we are just in healthcare. But yeah, like you said, there this is the land of 10,000 lakes, land of seemingly 10,000 healthcare companies. So. <laughs> For sure. Everything from startups, right? So Carrot's a pretty small group in comparison to something like Optum or UHG. Yeah. I mean, going to Carrot was almost a almost a 100% decrease in the, the size of, you know, the number of people working there. It's, <laughs> it's a mass massive difference so sure sure you know you mentioned having a background in economics i i'm just i'm just curious has that has that helped you in this role when you guys are starting to look at maybe some economic pieces behind healthcare do you you think it's given you a little bit more knowledge in the space that maybe maybe just a straight computer scientist you know wouldn't wouldn't have it, depending on who you ask you know there are uh, there's so many different answers you'll get uh, people will tell you about what's the best major what's the best you know, realm of academia for data science i would argue economics is a great starting point uh, I think it it helped me in a couple of ways. You know, one thinking about this is economics one on one stuff, but like the marginal value of incorporating something new into a system, right? I don't mm. know if I would have gotten that. And granted, I wasn't a CS major, so I can't exactly speak to that. But um, that is just drilled into you over and over and over mm. in throughout your economics courses. So it's kind of just something that's always with you there. Well, is it really worth it to incorporate? features X, Y, and Z into this model that are expensive in a certain way to get. You know, and also, I think it gives you a good foundation. It's, it's like another form of statistics, in a sense, you know, it's applying statistics in the economics realm. You know, it was a pretty rigorous uh, course load in terms of the types of models you're building, um, really from the ground up. It, it laid a good foundation, I think, for starting to think about some of these other problems. And it helps you to think about, you know, what are the, the benefits, like the cost benefits of what you're building? I mean, that's the basic tenet of doing this kind of work. Yeah, no, you, usually if there's not a return on investment, most companies aren't really interested in, in putting in a lot of effort, or at least if there's not a return on investment in in some period of time, right? So companies are willing to sort of take take the hit mm-hmm. when they build out a lot of these on projections and stuff like that. Do you have a sort of a definition of artificial intelligence at all? Sort of put you on the spot, I guess, like a elevator pitch, I guess, or even just, you know, this whole area of data science, I guess, you know, with, how would you define it? Yeah. Yeah. So like data science, it's an inherently multidisciplinary field, right? We're taking, mm-hmm. you think of the, I mean, the Venn diagrams that people have put out there as the statistics, math, computer science, business knowledge, right? And I think, mm-hmm. I mean, data science really is the intermingling of those three. And, you know, it's, it's rare that you would find an individual with all three of those skills, but, you know, having two of them is, is a really good start. You know, they're the unicorns that have all three, but, you know, it's really data science is applying that scientific method, which is, you know, a kind of a nebulous thing in the first place, but it's, it's really just being rigorous, having a constant curiosity, sort of an unrelenting scientific approach to every question you have as it relates to to your business, provided you have data for it or could obtain data for it. What's the saying, you know, in God we trust and for all others bring data, right? It's something Kevin probably mentioned <laughs> in the last call, but, um, yeah. you know, and then AI, I guess, I, I don't work with a, with a lot of, you know, AI technologies directly. I mean, in a sense, there's it's such a wide realm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but, you know, I, I saw this tweet by, uh, uh, Francois Chalet, the guy who uh, created Keras, you know, the, the deep learning framework. And he, you know, his, his opinion on it is it's not quite artificial intelligence, it's cognitive automation. So it's basically mm. the encoding and operationalization of human generated abstractions, behaviors, and skills. And 
I think at a, at a core level, I mean, a lot of these algorithms, you know, you're just finding a, a somewhat complex, you know, potentially complex, hopefully accurate mapping. You're trying to model a process, right? So you're finding a mapping between an input and an output. You know, that's kind of what it boils down to. But I also think there you know, might be a lot of emphasis on, it's a, it's a hot word, the artificial intelligence word. Yeah. You know, I think the degree to which certain technologies are artificially intelligent certainly differs. But um, at the end of the day, I, I think it'd be hard, you'd be hard pressed not to say, you know, some things are, are not intelligent at all, even though they might seem like, you know, simple logistic regression models. It's just a weird, it's just a different form of it, you know. Sure, sure. Thinking back about the sort of the cost savings, you know, businesses, like I said, will will invest in these new technologies if there is a cost savings to them. You know, in the projects you've worked on or, or things that you're seeing uh, currently, like in, 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 in the space, are, are you are you guys working with regards to like, I guess, automating away jobs in some ways? You know, I'm not sure if, if the projects that you're doing, you know, are related to that. But that's sort of a, a fear, I guess, that people who are building these systems, especially in the business space, are like, oh, great. Now a machine can do all these jobs that these hundreds of the people used to be able to do. And and obviously this data that you're working with in the healthcare field, there could have been a lot of people that would just pour over it manually. Now we can do a lot of these predictions. Do you, do you have any sense, I guess, of what this might impact, uh, I guess, future workers coming out of school and coming up through, through, through the ranks like you've done? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's an outstanding question. I don't see like the a lot of the stuff I've dealt with. I don't see a lot of displacement of work. You'll see a lot of in, you know people in this space talking about how it's like they're they're tools for enhancements, right? They a lot of models, you know, can kind of boil down to some sort of rank ordering you're trying to do with, you know, you're trying to basically sort through whatever records you're dealing with, whether it's members or IT uh, incident tickets, whatever. You're trying to prioritize them according to some measure, right? So, you know, in the case of, of star measures, for example, right, depending on the measure, of course, but we're basically trying to identify people who are going to be non-compliant for that, right? And and health plans already reach out to n number of people as it relates to these measures. And, and you know, in, in some cases, those approaches aren't as targeted, aren't as effective as they could be right, with, the, with the use of a predictive model. So what the model does is, you know, it, it bubbles up to the top, those individuals who are, you know, likely to meet your criteria, right? Those are the people mm-hmm. you really want to be in contact with. And so I don't know if it's as much of a, hey, you know, we can just get rid of people X, Y, and Z. Well, now you're giving this tool to those individuals who are you're likely very well acquainted with their domain and you're giving them kind of, it's, it's like a superpower, you know, to, to use kind of a cliche term, but yeah. um, you're giving them this, this sort of advanced mechanism to kind of sort through their data and make those right decisions. So it's, it's kind of an enablement, I think. Cool. Yeah. There's, I'm not sure if you've, if you've uh, heard of or read the book, it's called reprogramming the American dream. Um, and it's by, I think his name's Kevin Scott. I think he's the CTO at uh, Microsoft. And it's a pretty pretty interesting book because he's got a deep background in machine learning, deep learning. You know, he I, I'm trying to remember what he graduated in. He's got a PhD, I think, in in data related field. But long story short is is you know I haven't finished the book, but I'm I'm well into it. And it's really about it's a complementary skill set like you're talking about, and all these sort of fear mongers about every you know it's going to basically get rid of all these jobs. He has a much more positive spin on it. So highly recommend if people are listening to this to check out that book. It's called Reprogramming the American Dream. And I'll add some of that stuff in the liner notes when I end up publishing this uh, podcast. I'm not sure if you've read any books particular, you know, in this in this field that you would maybe recommend to people that are uh, looking to get into the field at all, Jake. Yeah, I just add that, add the one you just mentioned to my litany of books that I've uh, meant to read this, this quarantine, but haven't yet gotten around to. <laughs> I'm looking at a stack of uh, Nassim Taleb, a trader, you know, former trader, wrote a lot of books on um, just statistics and, and things of that nature. And so I haven't opened them yet, but I, okay. I know those are pretty well recommended. I'm eagerly uh, awaiting opening and reading those. Some other ones, uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. That was a sort of an economics book, Signal and Noise. That's by Nate Silver. I mean, that's, that's Nate a classic. Nate stuff is great. I, I, you know, you can, you can tell you I kind of lean towards the sort of applied use cases, economic point of views, things of that nature. So those are all sort of foundational books that I've 
but uh, other things I like, and, uh, and if you can find them, they're, they're old books, but like old textbooks by kind of the statistics, you know, uh, greats basically, you know, as it relates to data visualization or, or whatever. I got my hands on a book from like the the seventies hmm. uh, related to data visualization, and it's you know it's dusty and but it's it's nice, it's kind of like a, a forerunner's book. It's it's you know they're they're foundational tools, I think uh, these books. So yeah, yeah, some of that some of that stuff never changes, right? So yeah. if it's done well, it will sort of stand the test of time. Yeah, and oftentimes those the people writing those books have have you know if it's a later version, they've had ten goes at it, right? They've had you know, 10 times they publish it or whatever, and you're getting like their 10th attempt at, okay, this is really what it is. And, you know, at that point, you can really be uh, be assured that it's, it's probably solid information, you know? For sure. Well, what is what is the day in the life of somebody who is a senior data scientist at a healthcare startup company look like? You know, so it, one of the luxuries of, of the job is, and this is a, you know, kind of a cliche thing to say, but no day is the same, really. Um, you know, one day I will be, you know, depending on where I'm at in a certain project, I will be hands down, you know, I've got my text editor and the command line on one side and I'm just, you know, editing, running things, building models, hmm. looking through the performance of models, validating them six ways from Sunday, et cetera, et cetera. Those are days I love. Personally, I just like having that heads down time and just being able to sing kind of in silence through projects. Other days, um, which are also usually good days, you know, working with stakeholders to really flesh out their use cases. So I, I'm taking on a lot of new endeavors, new new product offerings. So, you know, as a part of that, uh, we've got to work with, well, what's the vision of the product entirely? The model is not the, the only thing fitting into the product. Sure. Our offering is basically a suite of dashboards and different analytic tools. And so the models are definitely a part of that, but you got to understand where the models are going to fit, what are the limitations of the data available, et cetera. Yeah, no day is the same, but it's, it's always learning something new. And, and as I said before, I don't know if you could succeed if you didn't have a relentless curiosity and, and always willing to ask questions because, you know, as a data scientist, you're, you're brand new to, a, you know, whether you're a statistician, whatever you call yourself, you're brand new to some sort of domain, right? And so you need to be able to, some, ultimately, you, you, know, you don't have to speak at the same level as the people who own the product, but um, you need to be able to kind of translate what they're saying into, you know, into a model and then what the model looks like back into what they want to hear. And you're always, always on your toes. So Nice. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea of always learning something new. In fact, just to share a little personal story here. Uh, just yesterday, my, my eight-year-old asked me, Daddy, if you could have any job in the world, you know, what would it be? And I thought about it for a while and I'm like, you know, I don't know if I could give you a actual occupation because it's so varied, but I know whatever I do, I want to make sure that I'm learning something new, right? So I think that's sort of a, a core tenant, I think, of, of anybody who's curious uh, in life. So that's great to hear that you've got that passion as well. Um, and you're right. I think it's sort of a foundational thing that you have to have when you're a scientist, you know, I mean, you're a scientist in the area of data, but you're always exploring and trying, trying new stuff and right. obviously learning yeah. stuff along the way. I was curious what sort of tool set you guys are using there. You know, you, you talked about having a, you know, editor up and stuff like that. What's, what sort of your, your tools you'd recommend people start to learn? Yeah, I am a uh, plain Jane sort of programmer. I, I like just visual studio code on one window and then the terminal on the other. Others really prefer things like Jupyter notebooks, R studio. We're primarily an R shop, mm -hmm. uh, which was a change coming from, united where i used uh python quite a bit although we are trying to enable more of a, a sort of language agnostic platform to a certain degree of course so yeah a lot a lot of folks prefer our studio yeah i don't know i like the simplicity of of the editor and the the command line there of course you know it's really difficult to visualize things in a command line it's hard to visualize some sort of uh, rock curve i don't know if there's really software for that quite yet visualize right from the command line but that's yeah, a, a simple way of doing things and so i you know i recommend usually for for people looking to get into the field you know knowing like a scripting language python and r is uh paramount 90 plus percent of shops probably use that knowing the command line is is really i would say it's almost just as important it's I probably spend more time there just using different unix tools and things that get you know the typical software engineering sort of skills are Incre becoming increasingly more important. So having that programming knowledge is definitely mm. needed. 
Sure. And those were all skills that you sort of picked up, right? You came out of school with a with an economics and, and I guess a minor in applied math. If right. I remember correctly. So you kind of picked up the, 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 the computer programming along the way. Yeah. Yeah. I only took one uh, formal CS course and everything was, I would, you know, pretty much self-taught. I mean, I learned a lot of it on the job, but uh, a lot of asking questions and, and actually answering questions on Stack Overflow, that was a really good way of, of learning how to, there's no better way of uh, figuring out whether your answer is right than posting on the internet for people to see and correct. So doing that really helped me to grow quite a bit. Yeah, no, I'm I, I'm pretty much self-taught as well. My undergraduate was in applied math and uh, physics, actually. So right. I, you know, started programming when I was a little kid on an Apple II, but I didn't actually go for the CSI degree and just ended up going more of a liberal arts track. But fell in love with programming and saw a lot of applications once I got out of school. So outside of your professional career, I mentioned these other meetup groups, you know, that you helped to co-found. That goes back, boy, man, that was probably what twenty. 14, 15, yeah. maybe? I can't remember when Analyze This, you know, started, but, you know, what what, what was your thinking around that, you know, getting getting involved in, in a community group like this when obviously you you just got out of school or were getting out of school and starting your career? Well, it's actually, ser- now that we think about it, it's actually kind of serendipity that I got involved with uh, the original, you know, Analyze This. Yeah, you know, my friend uh, ran the student alumni group at St. Thomas, and he goes, okay, you get first pick of, of who you want to talk to. And I said, oh, this is for business school kids. Mostly like just put me with someone look, looks like they're in technology and it's lo and behold, it's Justin. It was me. Within five <laughs> minutes, we're talking shop and it was like, oh my gosh, this is uncanny. It was, and so the next day, I think, you know, we went down to a bar in Northeast Minneapolis and then, you know, met with yeah. the, the original founders of that group. And I was, you know, very happy to be invited along and honored to. So yeah, I analyzed this, you know, we, we did a variety, um, you know, probably five different uh, analytics challenges uh, with local Twin Cities nonprofits. So we're basically serving two needs there. So one, you know, providing a platform for raising the level of talent, analytics, statistics in the Twin Cities, and providing a platform for people wanting to learn that skill set to one, connect, and B, uh, work on actual projects. But then also working with a nonprofit partner to, you know, identify some need they have. It's vital to their business, you know, assess the quality of the data they have around it and, and you know, speak to it and see if we can come up with some sort of analytic solution, often in the form of a, some sort of predictive model. They're trying to identify you know, people they want to prioritize in terms of um, you know, donors or uh, new renewals for, for the, like the Science Museum example. So yeah, we worked with, I mean, you were involved with that. I mean, we worked with the Science Museum of Minnesota, a variety of variety of it. You want to talk talk about that, like that project, you know, is it, it was more around the marketing dollars, right? Basically who who should we market to because they seem like they're the most ones to wanna to become a member. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So working with and I actually worked with the Science Museum on, on two occasions. I think one was trying to identify who is likely to be the biggest spend donors and, and prioritize kind of the, the bigger fish. And then follow up project, I think this was the story too we build models to identify who's even likely to donate a second time versus who's, who's going to be a one and done. So, yeah. And then putting those together, we kind of, again, this is getting at uh, the economics education. We we're thinking about, okay, we have these two predictive models. One predicts a continuous outcome, the amount of dollars we predict you to, given that you donated before, we're predicting what you're going to donate again. The other one's a probability between zero and one, you know, what's the likelihood you donate again? So I was like, ah, we were thinking how we put these together. And we actually just ended up multiplying them to get sort of an expected value of a second donation, right? Because we're predicting what that second donation would be with a margin of error, of course. And then two, you know, the likelihood you donate. And that was actually pretty effective in terms of sorting descendingly and Mm -hmm. going through people at the top of the list there and, and, giving them the appropriate level of touch, right? They have different levels of prioritization. They do the, the sort of spa treatment versus uh, sort of mailings that are that are cheaper. So that's what that was used for. And if actually, if actually, if I remember right, I just described Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity. I wasn't talking, yeah, I was mixing, you know, doing several projects, mix them up, but that was the habitat. But the Science Museum, we did a very similar project as well, so. Yeah. So analyze this. Yeah, it was basically a quarterly challenge, right? We'd have these groups sort of come together. People could sort of use whatever they they wanted, right? Which whichever sort of technique. And again, I'm just kind of taxing my memory a little bit. You were much more involved, but I mean, were some groups using deep learning? I mean, what would be you know now known machine learning, deep learning techniques, 
and other groups were sort of using the traditional logistic regression, right? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of teams, we, we, the membership of that group spanned the gamut from complete beginners to, you know, seasoned professionals who just really wanted to kind of flex their muscles and, and give back. Mm-hmm. So yeah, a lot of the models were more simple, like uh, logistic re- multiple regression uh, models. But we did have several, I think, as we got later on into the challenges, several people using more deep learning type approaches. I, there might have been one challenge, if I remember right, where you know word embeddings were used as part of a text data set that we had uh, available. But I remember one, Kevin and I, uh, we did a, this baseball challenge with Inside Edge, a, a local sports analytics company. And we did a trying to predict some, I don't remember what it was, but like a fantasy outcomes or something, trying to basically see who you could bet on mm. from a fantasy baseball perspective. And Kevin and I, Kevin Church and I, boy, we worked hard. I mean, just day after, day in and day out, trying to build a model from it by hand. And it was, it was like a logistic regression. It was fine or linear regression. And then one of the competitors, he's a PhD from the U of M who now works at Microsoft. He comes in the day of, and we're, we're presenting, and he, he presents this XG Boost model that just blows everyone out of the water. And we were talking to him afterwards, and he said, uh, gosh, Jared, how did you do this? How much time did you spend on this? And he goes, oh, I just did it last night. Like, it took no time at all. And, <laughs> and that really opened my eyes up to the, the potential of, you know, more sophisticated ensemble models like that, more machine learning, getting away from the more traditional statistics. Of course, there's a time and a place for both, but... That was a Kaggle-like competition, so when yeah. you're optimizing for a certain performance metric, that was really beneficial. So, you know, I I recall, and this was the Star eighty two days. Then was like, I mean, did did you do a project where you're trying to predict birds? I guess kind of getting into image recognition. Oh yeah, as well. Yeah, you, you have better memory than I do. <laughs> yeah, so we did uh, Star eighty two. We we ran a lot of pro- more like pet projects. I think we did work with a few local organizations. One of them was Mapping Prejudice, which you might actually have seen in the, in the news quite a bit lately. Popped up recently, for sure. Which That's like basically the D laws around people. Yeah, basically they, they run a platform, a volunteer-run platform, trying to identify racially restrictive housing deeds in Minneapolis. So that's a really interesting crowdsource project. We did something related to rating the, uh, like kind of the reliability of the, the voters and making sure people are you know, sort of agreeing with some sort of base standard helping to better educate some of the volunteers. But but yeah, we also ran a, an image recognition. This was sort of a, a project in which we wanted to really enable people to, to you know, leave work and get their own uh, pet projects off the ground. So I really wanted to get into image recognition. And, and so I worked with some colleagues of mine. I think we ended up just point, deploying one of the YOLO, like PJ Reddy's YOLO, you only look once from a Drake song, but you only look once models, pre-trained, you know, weights uh, and pre-trained and everything. But we just deployed that onto a Raspberry Pi. It's so funny though. I think if I remember right, the way that model was trained was off of like small like toys, basically. So like little, if I'm, if I'm remembering. Really? Well, no. Okay. That's the use case for it, actually. He, he, he showed the example of it being used by, you know, holding up a toy horse and doing that. Yeah. But that's kind of how we used it too. It was it was a good a good challenge deploying that kind of model on a on a Raspberry Pi and um, kind of sorting working with a uh, smaller device. Cool. Yeah. Were there any other projects I guess are, are around that that you would that you wanted to share? Yeah, you know, I I think we've covered most of the the ones I've talked about previously. I mean, the the rater reliability one was really fascinating. Looking at metrics like a Cohen's. I mean, I just I'll just kind of. Uh, say different things here but like cohen's kappa which is a measure of uh rater reliability and it, it was a unique project at least for me right that's not really a predictive model in any sense but you're looking at here's a set of deeds someone has tagged as x y and z they whether whether they found that language in it or not in the in the deed or not and here's what you know one of the the predecessors of the project what what she she's an expert what she labeled it as and you know so you can pretty well assume that she's probably getting it right and so it was, it was fascinating to be able to measure all these, you know, several thousand volunteers, you know, in this multidimensional space, the degree to which they agreed with that expert rater. So continuously being involved in the community, running these meetups and participating in other meetups is really, uh, it, it hints at that continuous learning, right? Whether it's, you know, you're running the project yourself, you have to manage, you know, who, who you're working with and kind of dividing up some of the work to actually doing the work yourself and consulting with. Uh, organizations that don't have these kind of capabilities built in. So 
that's one of the the biggest I think takeaways is that that continuous learning and and really engaging with these uh, groups to begin with. We, we had connections to certain of you know Kevin had had worked with some of them in the past, but oftentimes you know with the mapping prejudice example, I sent an email. I said, here's story two. Here's what we do, and here's I think why this could be valuable to you. Uh, and we worked with them to to define a use case related to something they you know is, is high value to them. You know, the worst someone can do is is say no in these types of situations, right? It doesn't. In a lot of cases, they'll be pretty receptive to, and not in every case, but they'll be receptive right. to sort of a you know an expert's eyes for a cheap rate pizza. <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, pop. yeah, and like you said, it's sort of like a win-win-win type situation, right? So even the people that are getting into this, when I participated. You know, I just I I learned a lot. I'm by, by no means an expert in this field, and so all of a sudden I'm working with people that do do this uh, on a day to day basis, and I'm helping out a, a nonprofit, and they're benefiting by having yeah a staff of people working on a project, a problem that they definitely don't have the resources internally. So it's like, kind of like everybody wins yeah. throughout the entire thing. I guess having you know been one who sort of started a number of community groups here in town, it's, you know, I, I, I tell people, you know, if you're any sort of project you're working on in technology, or I mean, it could even be even outside of technology, quite frankly, if you have a passion in something, chances are, there's somebody down the street that has that exact same passion as you. And at the end of the day, if you can raise a flag up the flagpole and say, hey, you know, I, I'm working on this problem, do you want to work on it with me? Or do you want to meet and talk about you know, artificial intelligence and, and its applications, which is what we're doing right now with this this new applied AI group that we're running here now uh, that was started earlier this year, people will, you'll, you'll be surprised. People will respond and it will be like a chain reaction. You know, you can be at the nucleus to sort of start this, but then so many other fun things happen. People that you never would have thought would have crossed paths cross paths in these in these groups yeah and whether it's a monthly meetup or a conference it's just it's really exciting to see absolutely yeah that's a great summary and you're, you're putting together people from i mean you think about you know how data science and how analytics is practiced you've got mostly people who are statisticians generally and so you know as, as a function of that they're working with so many different in so many different industries, so many different individuals, and you put them all in a room together, and you're I mean you're bound to find one people who agree with you, more importantly people who disagree with you, and you're able to you know learn from them and get get a perspective. And and, and the networking is also really great too. I mean there's no substitute I don't think for for getting out in the community and sort of making a name for yourself. Cool. Well, we we talked a little bit about you know books. We talked a little bit about maybe classes and stuff that people should take in college. Is there? I mean, if you're if you're somebody coming out of school today, I guess there are there other conferences or there. What what sort of resources do you you think would be good uh, for for somebody sort of coming up in the ranks today? Absolutely. So conferences uh, are great uh, in the Twin Cities specifically. You know, Mini Analytics is a great group for that. Of course, you know we're not putting on any major in-person conferences for the foreseeable future, but we're still doing things online, different ways to engage to that end and, and learn from others. Um, I've been to conferences in Boston before uh, that have been really great as well. Like the, the data science conference was a really great one that I went to out there. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I, I, I spend a, a lot of time kind of on different online uh, forums, mostly Hacker News, trying to uh, troll through that, you know, Y Combinator's news aggregator. Mm -hmm. Technology obviously is, is kind of the focus of that, but also as it relates to, to machine learning and everything. You, really, I, I think a lot of new frameworks, new technologies, new papers, if they're worth reading, will, will often be published on there, and you'll get in the, oh. the discussion in the comments there. Oftentimes, I, I you know, it's probably bad, but don't read the article or don't even not not even not even <laughs> just reading the headline or anything like that. But sure. I just like to read the, the comments because you'll you almost immediately get a, a reaction as to, like I said earlier, people will say, well, this is why this is debunked or blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, go back and read the article afterwards. But sure. it's always interesting to get someone's perspective beforehand. You know, some of the books I mentioned, I, I, I would highlight the, the idea of, of helping others, though. You know, I mentioned doing some work on Stack Overflow just to, to help my programming skills. But really, I, I don't know if there's a better way to learn than to have to explain something to someone, like sort of like rubber duck debugging in a sense, especially explaining it to like your mother or a, a non-technical person. 
uh, taking mm -hmm. something like that uh, and being able to distill it down and check your assumptions, define all your acronyms so they understand everything. I mean, that uh, that's a really great way to get a, a, an amazing amount of growth in a, in a short time, I think. Yeah, very good. Very good. Cool. Yeah, not, nothing forces you to learn it if you have to be the teacher. Right. And yeah, I, I know everything case. already. Yeah, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, you know, as we start to sort of wind, wind the conversation down here, uh, you know, how, what's the best ways for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, LinkedIn is really my uh, main connection. I'm not on Twitter or really anything like that. So um, just find me there. It's pretty easy to find. You know, it's a little Google foo. So. Cool. Again, like I mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll have links and stuff like that in the podcast notes uh, off to your LinkedIn page. Is there any other thing you wanted to talk about or, or share that I might have overlooked today? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I just like the, the one piece of advice I would blast out into the, the universe as it relates to, to this profession is kind of like a, a humility, I guess, and, and sort of a lack of pride. <laughs> Learning how to ask an effective question, it was, I think, far and away the, the biggest step in, in terms of like where I've, where I've come. And I've got a long ways to go, of course, but that was a huge sort of step change. I, I think the way I work with others, learning how to okay, I have a question about something, you know, doing my research, looking down all the avenues I can to a, you know, to a reasonable extent, right? You don't want to waste an entire day uh, trying to figure out something that you could have asked someone willing to help within a few minutes. But, um, you know, really doing your homework, setting the, the person who you're going to ask the question to up for success, you know, giving them the full context and, and really having that humility and, and, and to to not be worried about, you know, what, how they're going to react. And there really are no dumb questions. I mean, there could be, but um, not worrying about that, right? If you're a beginner to something, it's much better to ask a bad question or potentially dumb question at the beginning of an, an engagement with someone versus six months in, and they already thought you knew that, and that changes the scope of everything you're doing. So ask early and often, I guess, would be my, my final advice. Great. That's definitely a great, great piece of advice. Well, great, Jake. Looking forward to tracking you as you continue on in your career and appreciate again the time sharing your knowledge and experience here with Conversations on Applied AI podcast community and uh, wish you nothing but the best. Look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Justin. I really appreciate the invite and uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you and talk with you. It's been a while, but always a pleasure. So thanks. Thank you. Take care. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.